Hi. Uh, so, my name is Yuval, uh, also known as uh, Nothing Much online. Um, I think, uh, in the interest of, uh, like, there's going to be some slides with uh, a bit of math, a bit of text, some diagrams, so um, you might want to move uh, forward a bit, but um, yeah. Um, so, like, used to do a bunch of Perl stuff, then I got burnt out. Uh, eventually, Bitcoin uh, screwed me up and uh, started caring about software again. Um, I was involved with uh, Wasabi. Um, not really happy about that history. Um, I would encourage you to interrupt for questions and clarifications, but maybe not about the Wasabi stuff. We can uh, <laughs> save that for offline. Um, yeah, so. Um, so what I'm hoping to achieve today is to kind of, um, first of all, like, give you a sense of like where I'm coming from, why I think this stuff is important, so you can uh, better um, like figure out what, like, why I'm telling you this stuff. Uh, then we're going to look at, um, I guess, classic papers from uh, the privacy literature in uh, like a very superficial way. Um, then we're going to see how those models can be applied to Bitcoin, uh, both in general. Um, then we're going to discuss a little bit about how you might treat the, like, why this is in general an optimization problem, and, you know, how, how you would approach with, like, in, in the dynamic setting, uh, interacting with untrusted parties, like, how you can actually maximize your payoff, as it were and the practical challenges around uh, like real protocols. And, uh, so, um, I guess f for me, the whole privacy question splits up into two main parts. There's the individual angle and kind of the emergent or social perspective. Um, for the individual part, I think it's mainly to do with, um, like, you, you can't really have freedom and agency without privacy. Like, if you're not um, able to have uh, control over your own thoughts, your own uh, life. Um, you are vulnerable to coercion, you're vulnerable to exploitation, um, and it's just everybody deserves privacy on some level. I think that's like an axiom, basically. Um, on the more social perspective, um, I would claim fungibility is emergent from uh, privacy. Um, we have, uh, like, there's many notions of fungibility that we'll kind of go into, but like, the legal sense, the technical sense, and the social sense, I guess. But, um, regardless, like, it should be obvious that if you have perfect privacy, then there is no way in which one could discriminate between points. Um, so, uh, fungibility would be, like, truly guaranteed in, in that kind of scenario. Um, and the second aspect is uh, censorship, where like if coins are non-fungible, they're like they carry some additional data, then um, that makes it easy to discriminate. And we've seen evidence for this with uh, centralized exchanges rejecting coin joins, stuff like that. Um, and perhaps this will happen on the, the protocol level at some point as well. So um, there's a lot of room for improvement. And um, yeah, well, I guess those are my assumptions. Um, and then more generally, why I care about Bitcoin, um, like, you know, why not privacy shit coins or whatever. Um, I think Bitcoin is unique in that it's the, the least unfair, given that it was first. Um, it strongly favors verification and its assumptions. It makes very conservative assumptions. Uh, also, I happen to be like a, a tree hunter who's in favor of proof of work. And um, I think... Like, I, I'm not rooting for hyper-Bitcoinization, I'm much more like, I, I think it has a complementary role to play with the, the debt-based uh, economy, and uh, so, yeah, um, this stuff, like, I think Bitcoin can do a lot for the world, but it, it needs to actually um, address some of its uh, current deficiencies for me to, like, really be optimistic about the future. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, hopefully, if you think I'm insane, now you can uh, have a good uh, sense of why. Um, so let's kind of dive into, like, how do we even theoretically 
think about privacy. So it's common to define privacy as like the ability to control personal information pertaining to oneself, um, like the ability to do selective disclosure. Um, so if you choose to reveal personal information about yourself, about your activities, um, privacy gives you the choice. Um, and in order to have the choice, uh, we can kind of look at the limited case, which is uh, anonymity. Anonymity is like um, the, the maximal sense of privacy in which you, you reveal essentially nothing, and in a system that supports privacy, that would be the baseline. And uh, any, like, it, it's not a requirement to be anonymous for a system to support privacy. There's no contradiction between being transparent, between sharing details, but um, it's primarily about choice. So, yeah, hopefully the terminology makes sense. Um, what about anonymity? Um, so typically in the literature, anonymity is defined in terms of um, like how well you blend into a, a context, into a crowd of other individuals, other people, entities, if you're an organization. Um, the, the, the game, as it were, um, is for an adversary to try and recover the identifying information about you. So, hopefully it's obvious that if you have no crowd in which to blend, like, there's no anonymity there. There's, um, like, anonymity is always um, the result of multiple parties, multiple entities um, interacting with each other in some sort of system. Um, and so what is this adversary that's trying to de-anonymize or uh, re-identify the participants in the system? Um, in, in the context of Bitcoin, it's, it could be your counterparties, like people you receive from or people you send to. Uh, it could be your peers on the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it could be uh, malicious parties that are going after your, your funds, they're trying to like uh, steal from you or whatever, and it's also like dragnet surveillance, which could be uh, governments, um, like the Snowden revelations, or um, uh, also the um, business of, uh, uh, Chris Belcher calls this uh, transaction surveillance, uh, or more globally, the chain analytics companies. Um, so that there's for-profit entities which um, make a business of trying to draw inferences about the, the data that's on the blockchain, the data that's spread on the peer-to-peer -peer network, and um, for various purposes they, they sell it, typically compliance, um, and it's all of these situations kind of remove choice and agency from the individual users. So, um, yeah, we're, we're interested in various kinds of counter, uh, sorry, various kinds of adversaries, um, everybody has their own threat model, and that threat model might involve uh, multiple types of adversaries. Um, but if you kind of want to think about it like um, in a in, um, more um, abstract way, uh, just imagine that like there is a single adversary and it has some capabilities, and uh, any individual instances in the real world are uh, essentially part of that same adversary. So this could be things like um, exchanges sharing information through chain analytics companies to each other. Um, uh, like, it, it, in this more technical context, it makes sense to think of that as like a single adversary and not necessarily separate entities. Okay, so the simplest model for anonymity that I know of um, is called uh, K-anonymity. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the history. I think it traces back to this work uh, by Piranvila uh, Samarati, I probably mispronounced that, and uh, Latani Sweeney. Um, this work, um, it, it had kind of been like well known at the time, if I understand my history correctly, but um, they, um, in 1999, I think they, they published a paper that demonstrated that the de anonymization of, sorry, the anonymization of the US census data was essentially, um, like, baloney. Like, um, the data was shared publicly, but with uh, some personal, personally identifying information um, elided. Um, but it turned out that there was always enough um, distinguishing characteristics, or not always, but um, typically there were enough uh, distinguishing characteristics to re-identify 
um, elements of that data set by cross-correlating with the voter registries. So um, don't quote me on the figures here, but um, it, um, for, for some places, like the combination of zip code, gender, and birth date was enough to do something like more than 80% uh, recall. Like, the, the distinct combination of those fields um, was sufficient to match it against the voter database and recover information like the name and, and so on. Um, so, the way that they, like this paper is basically split into two parts, the K-anonymity model, which is just um, saying that there is a, a set of entities which is of size K, among which um, like there can be no distinctions made, right? Um, so for example, all the people who were born on some month or something uh, and live in the same zip code and are of the same gender, like if only that information is available, count up how many of those there are and that's your value of K. Um, and because there's no additional information, um, the modeling assumption here is that the adversary um, like typically in, in cryptography and privacy literature, um, this is done through like game theoretical definitions. So um, the adversary tries to win in the de-anonymization game and can do no better than chance, right? Like if if you have a, a one over k probability of guessing correctly, then in that situation you can say that it's k anonymous. Um, the paper itself is actually uh, far more interesting, I think. Um, sorry. I'm Scale my text for a different resolution. Mm -hmm. oh, I think I'll just scroll. Okay, so um, it's kind of an interesting model, and it's interesting to think about also in the context of um, like blockchain data. So what they define is a data release. Like if a, an organization of some kind wants to release some anonymized data, conceptually this is a table where um, individuals or entities are represented by rows, and the columns or attributes in their terminology or the fields that describe the rows. And um, some of these attributes might be uh, unique. So for example, if you put the social security number in the US Census data, well, there's only one such value assigned to every entity. Whereas, um, as we discussed before, things like um, zip codes and, and so on are, um, are not necessarily unique. So the, the term for that um, dates a bit further uh, back. I think it's like from the 80s. Um, they call this a quasi-identifier, and the idea is that quasi-identifiers are partially identifying um, attributes of, of this database. And the key thing to observe is that the combinations of quasi-identifiers, like, uh, as we said before, like somebody who's uh, male and has a specific birth date and lives in a specific zip code, that um, tuple might itself become a, a uh, unique identifier. Um, so, um, they also propose a, a method for, um, sorry, I think that gives us a little bit more real estate. So, um, they define a, a sort of method for uh, ensuring that um, data sets are adequately anonymized. Um, and the, the procedure they, they give is uh, basically just um, either generalize or suppress the values of the field. So what does generalization mean? So if your birth date, um, I mean it's a, a year, a month, and a date, if that is too unique in the context of the data set, then um, perhaps publishing um, the data release uh, using only years and, and months um, will give enough like value, right? The, the, there's a reason that these data sets are published. Um, it's for their usefulness, so perhaps the data set is still useful, but you can confirm that it actually conforms to the, the K-anonymity model, that the assumption kind of holds uh, in that um, no unique combination of, of quasi-identifiers uh, singles out um, less than K rows at a time. Okay, so uh, that model is kind of oversimplified. Getting in trouble with uh, scaling here. Uh, okay, so this is um, another very important paper. Um, this is called uh, Towards Measuring Anonymity. Um, 
Claudia Diaz, uh, Stefan Seis, Doris Klassens, and Barbara Neal. Um, this is a paper from uh, shortly after, I think it's like the early 2000s. Um, and it too is kind of split up, as far as I'm concerned, into like two separate pieces. So one is this qualitative model of um, the adversary. Um, and uh, this is what's truncated uh, on the screen here. But um, it's, there's three dimensions that the adversary uh, can be described in terms of um, active versus passive. So is the attacker only listening? Uh, so for example, um, uh, the, the, the Snowden revelations um, demonstrated that the NSA has active capabilities with uh, packet injection. Um, that's a very different threat model than just passively collecting data. Um, the second dimension over which they characterize the adversary's capabilities are whether or not it's global or local. Um, so in this paper, they typically um, look at network sort of uh, structures. Right? There, there's um, different nodes on the graph, different entities that are communicating with each other. Um, they're exchanging messages, um, which is a, a very general model for describing variety of systems. They analyze mixed nets and um, anonymous remailers and uh, stuff like that, um, as well as uh, onion routing. So uh, a global adversary would have a view of the entire network, whereas a local adversary might only have compromised uh, certain nodes on the network. Um, and then finally, there is the, um, what's not appearing on the screen, is the, the final dimension is uh, internal versus external. So. Um, if you consider an active, global, internal adversary, that's basically an omnip uh, omnipotent uh, entity. Uh, an internal uh, attacker has access to your actual devices, uh, whereas uh, an external entity might only be able to make direct observations of its local. Right? So, for example, your ISP would be a, a local adversary on your network, um, and, and if you consider the router that maybe you get from it as um, uh, like part of your uh, node, as it were, um, and they control the configuration, then you might consider that an internal adversary. Um, but yeah, basically, if you have, if you're dealing, if your threat model is an active global internal adversary, then there's basically nothing you can do. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll we'll be concerned with uh, uh, less powerful ones for the most part. Um, so, yeah, they, uh, in the system model, uh, senders and receivers exchange messages, and the uh, adversary is uh, trying to guess for a given message who the sender, or completely um, dual to that, who the receiver is. Um, and the, the model is quite sophisticated in that, it, um, like, because these networks are not as straightforward as, as just uh, mixnet, mixnets, for example, um, so, for example, there's a system called uh, Crowds, which they analyze, which is a little bit like onion routing, but um, perhaps it, uh, you will be familiar with uh, Dandelion. Um, it's got a sort of similar like probability of forwarding, which is um, not really uniform. And um, this implies that the, if the, the adversary knows the structure of the network and has compromised a single node, and it knows which other nodes can forward to that node, um, then the, the probability it will assign for, let's say, Alice versus Bob being the center of a certain message, might be um, you know, very non-uniform. So how do they actually look at it? Um, I think this is the, the most math that we're going to deal with. Um, let me just turn off my Wi-Fi. This is Okay, so, um, so the adversary is assigning a, a probability here. Um, X is uh, a discrete variable um, that denotes like who the sender or receiver is uh, for a given guess. And um, the probability that they assign to um, X being, let's say, Alice or Bob, denoted here by I, um, if, if you aggregate over all the different possibilities, um, the formula for entropy, and it's kind of going to go into it, uh, apologies, but, um, so, think of PI as like one over 
the value. For me, it's much more intuitive. Like, if there is a one in a thousand chance that Alice sent the message, the the logarithm of a thousand um, kind of gives you the, the unit of measurement here is bits, and this is characterizing how many bits of information, how many binary questions does the adversary need to ask in the optimal case in order to narrow down that information. Like, how much more information uh, is required in order to, to, to pin it down. Um, and uh, essentially, the, the formula for entropy here is, is taking like a weighted average of the uh, individual contributions of, of every probability. So, um, like we multiply the probability by the logarithm of the probability, and uh, since this is less than one, um, like we're, we're intuitively more interested in the uh, inverse of, of pi. So that's why there's a, a negation here. Um, hopefully, the this kind of makes sense, but just as like a, a trivial example, if there is a set of size two, the adversary needs one bit of information. Um, like, is it user A? No, it must be user B in that case. Um, that's a, a single Boolean value that has given the adversary all the information required to fully de-anonymize in, in that case. And if it's 1,024 users, then by analogy that would require um, 10 bits for the uniform case, but the key thing to observe here is that this is far more general than the uniform distribution. So, um, in the event that this is uh, highly biased um, towards a specific value, the adversary actually needs considerably less information in order to um, to be able to guess correctly. Um, I think, like, uh, I would encourage you to, like, this is yeah, uh, super important, so if anybody's got, uh, like, a need for clarifications, or... Okay. So, how do we apply this to the context of Bitcoin? Um, so, I, I want to kind of go on a tangent for a little bit and uh, propose this, like, idealized token abstraction. Um, it's going to come up um, two more times. Um, and this thing is, like, as if by magic, uh, as cryptographers occasionally say, like, uh, there's a, a coin in the sky, so imagine like a pie chart in the sky. Um, anybody can own a slice of that pie, um, and only the owner can transfer that to anybody else in the system. And the, the only thing of importance in this uh, abstraction is the, the relative size. Um, and we don't really care about all the, the real world details, right? This is a complete like platonic abstraction. It's, it's not, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't actually exist, um, and we're intentionally leaving unspecified whether or not the size of this pi is, uh, is known, whether or not you can subdivide it infinitely, um, how do people actually, like do, do we all just know in our heads or do we use some sort of magical consensus system to agree on what the current state of the pi is? Like, uh, all of that is um, going to be, um, like, the, the individual examples that I'm going to apply this kind of abstraction to is, is um, um, like, that's where those details are going to start to matter. So, the first use of this is, like, how can we qualitatively characterize what a fully anonymized system would look like, um, something that's maximally private. Um, so, if nobody knows anything about the actual distribution, um, if transfers occur in a way that's completely bilateral, like if Alice sends money to Bob, only Bob knows that he received from Alice, and Alice knows that she sent to Bob. Nobody else has learned about this transaction. Bob has not learned about Alice's other transactions, and Alice has not learned about Bob's other transactions. Um, neither Alice nor Bob learns anything other than the, the balance change, so Alice only learns that Bob's balance has increased by the transferred amount, and Bob only learns that Alice's um, balance has decreased by the corresponding amount. Neither knows the, the remaining amounts that they control. Um, uh, in, in that kind of system, we, we would have perfect privacy. Um, and, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I know we're still giving a very abstract level, but, but 
what about provability and deniability? Like Alice and Bob, you say nobody else by default knows anything about it, but can Alice prove to a third party that she proved the same Bob? And also, can she deny by proposing an alternative? What does that mean? So, I would say for a system to actually be private, it would necessarily have to give Alice the capability to prove that. Um, otherwise, it would be strictly anonymous, right? If, if she cannot, um, and, and there, there are situations in which that may be important. So, for example, perhaps you're accused of um, some sort of crime or something, and, and you want to prove your innocence. Um, a, a maximally, a, a fully anonymous system might not guarantee that, but as I, I've written maximally private, then yes, uh, I think that would... The definition of privacy somehow includes the ability to audit or prove or... Not necessarily, like, uh, thinking much more abstractly here, um, like, if there's some mechanism whereby Alice could uh, demonstrate to others, um, like, in Bitcoin that would be... Um, making a proof based on keys she possesses, or so on. Um, like, I'm trying to think here much more in terms of like um, a platonic idea, right? An unrealizable goal that just gives us, kind of bounds the space of possibilities. Yeah? Uh, would you say that physical cash comes pretty close to this platonic ideal? Uh, yeah, so for, for like, um, you know, maybe Alice opens her wallet and Bob sees some of the other cash, but she can be more careful, or maybe he just sees that her wallet is like super fat. Um, so, so they actually, so the best practices, like not, like using it properly is part of the um, privacy properties of the system. Yeah, although, again, I'm not talking about a concrete thing. I'm just trying to delineate like what is the maximum that could theoretically ever be achieved under like a variety of different systems. And indeed, like, um, like let's think of how um, various real world systems um, maybe approximate this like pie in the sky model. So like in fiat, you know, we, we don't really know, you know what the total size of the pie is. Um, the initial distribution like is maybe not fair. Technically, I didn't, I didn't really look into, you know, I, I didn't make any claims about issuance in that model, so I would say it still fits. Um, the distinction between like physical cash and digital fiat is, I think, um, hugely important in this regard. Like, even, even though like actual bills uh, have serial numbers and coins may have uh, like defects that let you recognize them, practically speaking, they are for the most part interchangeable. Um, and fiat is also like subject to censorship, so like we, we don't really have that agency where, um, like in, in the, the digital version of fiat, like uh, Alice is not unilaterally responsible for deciding to send money to Bob. Like maybe her bank decides that you know that's you know like in Venmo when they put you know I'm gonna pay you back for this uh, uh, the Palestinian restaurant that I ate at, and then that's like censored for supporting terrorism, like. That kind of crap has actually happened. Um, so, like, um, a very different kind of uh, instantiation of that abstraction is, like, uh, the stable isotope of gold, which is, uh, as far as we know, like, there's no real way to distinguish between the different atoms. Um, and the way that it deviates from that, like, pie in the sky model is that it's you know, a lot more cumbersome, right? How, how do we agree on how much there is, or who it belongs to, and how do we transfer it? There's a lot of practical considerations there. Uh, and eCash is another favorite, where um, there I think the, the major, like, deficiency in this approximation is that the, there's typically a central issuer or a federation of issuers that uh, technically can, can print as much money as they, they want. Um, some, uh, and pardon the, the pun here, but some uh, slightly more obscure ones. Um, this first one is uh, a bit of a theoretical interest. Um, I, I forgot to post the slides, but it'll, I'll, I'll share a link later um, so you can uh, um, click on all, the, all that stuff. Uh, uh, so this is a, um, a paper that I have to admit I don't understand. <laughs> but. Um, uh, the idea there is that uh, applying the quantum no cloning theorem, um, in principle, you could have a system that ensures uh, double spending is um, prevented um, purely through physics, and it could still be a digital bearer token. Um, and um, you know, another like version of, of something 
that has much stronger privacy characteristics is um, not Zcash as a whole, in my opinion, but the, the shielded pool, where um, a single transaction doesn't reveal, like, um, it's, it's completely indistinguishable, uh, assuming the cryptographic assumptions hold. Uh, actually, no, there's unconditional sum, um, unconditional ID. So, um, never mind, I have a brain fart. But um, transactions in Zcash don't, um, don't reveal anything other than that the transaction was valid. Um, and, and that's where it's... Uh, I, I, I might be wrong, but I think technically it's not completely true because there are individual coins in Zcash. So they came up with like silly examples where somebody, just by virtue of spending like 10 coins at once, is actually giving away some information. Mm. But apart from that, I wouldn't matter, I'm not so true. It's, uh, yeah, the coins are indistinguishable, but the, the transactions are obviously not. <laughs> So I, I was not, I, for some reason, I, I, the, my understanding of it, which is very superficial, was that the, the joint split stuff happens, like, it is not over. I, but mean, the, the, I saw a thread with actual Zcash no, no. talking about this. That's the only reason I'm saying otherwise I wouldn't have known. I'm sure you're right about this, because I have not studied it in, in detail. So, like, yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's a But anyway, we don't care about those, right? We care about those. <laughs> So, um, how does Bitcoin fare uh, in comparison to this like abstraction? Um, so, it works over the internet. That means that we have all these like uh, network level privacy leaks, um, quasi identifiers like uh, IP addresses, or perhaps unique identifiers if you actually own the address. Um, temporal fingerprints could also be characterized as uh, quasi identifiers. Like, um, is this an entity that is known to uh, use the network at certain times? Um, the sort of state of the pie, how we transition, um, that is uh, achieved through proof of work um, and Nakamoto consensus. Uh, and proof of work is also responsible for the initial distribution. Um, we encode ownership through um, zero knowledge proofs, um, signatures, um, that um, although they are, they don't reveal the private key. That is the only sense in which they are zero knowledge. The, the public key is still associated with uh, those signatures, um, and that's merely pseudonymous. So um, a public key is a unique identifier, but a user may have many of those, and the relationship between them might not be uh, known to the adversary. Uh, and we'll look at that in, in more detail. Um, and um, the, the values themselves uh, are fully transparent, so um, the amounts that you specify in the transaction are also quasi-identifiers. The connectivity on the graph, so uh, a coin comes out of a specific transaction and then is spent into a subsequent transaction and that links uh, overtly um, the transaction that came before and the transaction that came after to each other. Um, and this is a transitive relation, right? You can go arbitrarily deep in either direction and uh, um, and every single like pair of coins on the network um, could potentially like be considered a quasi-identifier, right? Like um, a, a one-bit quasi-identifier that says, um, "Are you a descendant of or an ancestor of that coin?" Uh, that's information that is very hard for the. And I think I made a mistake here. It's quadratic, not exponential. Um, um, but the the adversary, you know, might be constrained in using this, right? It, it's it's very difficult to take into account so much information. But you know, um, it, it, that might not be true for particular cases. So um, if you want to take a, a more like cautious perspective, uh, generally assume that the the this, this kind of information is. Um, and, and finally, it's uh, Bitcoin, like in, in a technical sense, coins are truly non fungible because they have a unique identifier uh, like on, on the blockchain. Um, so, before moving on to the, like, the on chain stuff, um, I'm going to reduce the. F no, sorry, I should have put more time into trying this stuff out. <laughs> I've, I'm experimenting with uh, this presentation. So, um, just a few final words on um, the uh, network level. 
Um, so uh, there's a very influential paper, um, Anna and Love's Company. Um, this was about the um, um, the usability questions affecting Tor um, with regards to how much responsibility do you put on users to make the right choices in the system, and as a consequence of that, um, are you accidentally excluding users from the system? And maybe the better trade-off, that's kind of the, the argument the speaker is trying to make, is to oversimplify and maybe not address everybody's needs, but be more inclusive and in, in that way um, allow the anonymity sets to grow uh, significantly larger. So the, the size of the network is, is very much a concern. Um, there's um, Interesting work by uh, Amini Udarwar um, for Bitcoin Core um, that's, uh, I, I would encourage you to look at. Um, uh, this is with regards to um, when your node receives a payment, um, it recognizes the transaction as one of its own uh, if it's configured with a wallet. And this means that uh, it's going to notice if this transaction is not getting into blocks. It used to be very naive that every several minutes it would rebroadcast its own transactions and that was a, a very strong fingerprint. So this is substantially improved now, um, but could in theory be uh, further improved. So um, this is a very long ongoing project and yeah, I would encourage you to, to study it. Um, no talk about Bitcoin privacy would be complete without uh, at least mentioning uh, that kind of privacy. So like how you actually obtain the data. Um, if you're running a full node, you're downloading all of it. But if you're only downloading the data that interests you, you're revealing to whoever you downloaded it from that you're interested in those particular uh, parts of, of the data set. Um, and this is a very interesting and recent project, um, Spiral BTC. As far as I know, there, is there any relation to Spiral, the company? No. no. So this is um, private information retrieval. It's kind of like... Um, um, a whole subfield of the uh, privacy and cryptography literature that, that deals with, with how you can obtain uh, data. So they provide a service that lets you, uh, at present, uh, query your balance in a way that doesn't reveal who you are. Um, so, um, yeah, this slide's a bit of a mess because it's... Uh, any questions about these things before we kind of... yeah. So is Spiral BTC just another like client code protocol like 237 and 159? It's not specified in, in any way. I think it's like um, Dan students um, at Stanford started a company that um, they developed a new private information retrieval uh, protocol that's like more efficient and this is like a demonstrator project. Hopefully it will become standardized. Um, they also have another demonstrator for um, doing lookups on Wikipedia. Um, so it's, it's a more general thing that just it could be applied to making a light Bitcoin, yeah. but it could be applied to other things as well. In, in private information retrieval in general allows you to make, like, you could, you know, the, the trivially private way of obtaining the data is downloading all of it. So if you only wish to download a subset, the trade-off that is made in these protocols is um, you send a query to the server and that query is encrypted in, in some way and the, the server needs to go through the entire database, apply it to everything and extract your results in such a way that it does not know which uh, parts of the database actually affect it. So essentially it's, it's a, a, a bandwidth to server CPU trade-off. Um, and the interesting thing about this field in general is that the, it, it's, it's better than a linear trade-off, right? It's not just, um, like, and there's multiple settings, like multi-server versus single server, and yeah, it, it's a whole, like, rabbit hole of uh, very cool stuff. Um, is there any consideration given to preventing denial of service? It sounds like it's a lot of work for the server. Um, so this work, um, from what I have managed to piece together is, is uh, substantially more practical than previous works, but ultimately, like, not, not, not as far as I know, it's still, like, costly, and I think you would have to, uh, for this kind of thing to be sustainable, um, because the server needs to scan the whole thing. I mean, it's not so hard for a, a powerful server to do that, 
but probably you, you would need some sort of uh, additional uh, like abuse prevention. Uh, like, a, like a payment, like a fee. For instance, yeah. As far as I know, they are actually planning to do that. I mean, it was like a very big, talking to the developers, that can use and, um, yeah, so, so basically at the moment, just, it's like a public blockchain for service they're already doing. And I believe it is still free, right? But, they, but they, he was saying, like, of course, because it's actually quite expensive, and they, they would have to be charged for it. Yeah, the, the cost uh, for the server increases with the size of the data set. Right. That's why this example is only about the UTXO set, not the entire blockchain. But it, it, it can be solved by just throwing more CPUs at the problem. Um, and the more, like, the first and kind of broken approach was uh, blue filters, and nowadays uh, neutrino filters. Um, this is a much a far less sophisticated way of uh, kind of achieving this, the same uh, goal of not letting the network know what exactly you're interested in. Um, but the assurances are, are not as uh, strong. So, um, yeah, I, I think I kind of want to skip over like those details and focus on the on-chain stuff. Oh, sorry, I forgot I had to split this line. So, um, Another beautiful, beautiful paper, um, also uh, with uh, Claudia Diaz uh, and I think her students um, at uh, uh, Leuven, I think. Um, this paper applies the entropic model um, from the second paper that I mentioned, um, specifically to uh, Dandelion, Dandelion++ Plus Plus and the Lightning Network. And um, the really cool thing about this paper is um, it's simulation driven. So they, uh, for Dandelion and Dandelion++, they generated uh, synthetic graphs um, as per the specification. Um, and then simulated for um, a number of uh, corrupted, randomly corrupted nodes, um, like what the implications are. Um, and um, for Lightning, they actually took the real uh, network topology, and uh, this paper very recently got an update. Um, um, and um, yeah, for, for all three protocols, um, they make the claim that the, the privacy guarantees are a lot more brittle than we, uh, uh, you know, commonly believe. And um, I, I think they make a fairly compelling case for that. Um, whether or not it's reasonable to believe that if there is indeed that degree of surveillance, that's a whole other question. But if you assume that 1% of the nodes on the Lightning Network right now, and in particular um, the centralized nodes, like um, nodes with a, a high degree of connectivity on the graph, uh, are compromised, then um, I, I think they, they gave a figure that was like in the high 90s uh, of, of percents as far as like inferring whether a single Lightning payment originates from a specific node. So, um, yeah, I highly encourage you to look at this paper as well. I think an interesting yeah. thing about that one, too, was I think that's the same one that kind of highlighted, like, as the Lightning Network was getting bigger, yeah. it was becoming yes. less private just because of the uh, centralization aspects of it. Yeah, so uh, I think this bears repeating since the question is probably on, not recorded. And, and please remind me to, to do this in general. Um, but, uh, yeah, one, one of the very interesting results of this uh, latest update is that the as the network has grown, the concern has become uh, uh, more dire. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, when you say that there are nodes that be compromised, what does it mean exactly to have a compromised node? So, um, they go into the details as per the qualitative model of the previous paper. Um, for Lightning, I think they characterize it as a, a I don't think active versus passive really matters, uh, but I think it was a passive, local, uh, internal adversary. So uh, one of the nodes along the route um, is basically revealing to the adversary everything that is seen, and if the adversary is able to obtain such information from multiple like central points on the network, then the probability of guessing correctly where a payment originated from um, is actually quite high, and, and there's a number of assumptions that go into this. The graph topology, the routing algorithms, um, and uh, to, just for completeness, they don't analyze uh, multi-path payments. So, um, Does this require cooperation from those nodes on the, uh, in the route? 
us? Or is this, like, are they controlled by the adversary? Yeah, so corrupted means controlled in this case. Um, like, you can, you can just, um, to, to put it more simply, um, the adversary, you can imagine that it has um, started up remotes and gotten users to connect to them and is now writing payments. And the, the reason for that was surveillance. Um, that, that would be, uh, but I mean, not necessarily, right? They're, they're trying to be more general in, in their characterization. Okay, so, um, it's worth mentioning um, blockchain external, or even uh, like protocol external information as well. Um, so, uh, recently we've seen, uh, you know, trusted third parties um, that censor, but um, a very notable recent example is the um, uh, Celsius case, uh, where uh, when Celsius went bankrupt, um, ostensibly to protect their customers, um, I think it was the Canadian regulators? I don't, I don't recall, but um, in the court filings, they basically disclosed customers' entire, like, uh, I think six months or like last year of, of transfers, including the cryptocurrency, the date, the amount. So more than enough information to basically dox all of their customers, and the really terrifying thing about this is that this is also affecting everybody else. Like any Celsius customer which may have interacted with somebody else who is more mindful of privacy and not looking to, you know, get a free ride uh, um, and earn the, you know, the yields. Um, those people are going to be hurt by this as well simply by being uh, relatable on the blockchain to, to those uh, payments. Um, and the same thing is true for uh, UTXO set forks, so uh, eCash, etc. Um, that's going to have multiple signatures by the same key on different blockchains. Uh, every one such transaction reveals more. Um, they can be linked differently, so it kind of violates the double spending assumption from the point of view of um, privacy. Um, and um, yeah, it's. it's uh, also concerned when your wallet doesn't segregate between like testnet and uh, mainnet. Okay, so now um, going into the the meat of it. Um, so this is just like a, a diagram. Like this is how I'm going to be drawing transactions today. Um, heavy borders indicate something that's unspent, just for uh, readability's sake. Um, and um, yeah, so let's look at something. Oh, sorry. Out of order. Um, this, I think, what I meant to say is that, like, it's not just the amounts that appear on the blockchain. Obviously, like uh, at the the real protocol level, we have uh, other data of, of interest. So the types of scripts, um, whether or not you try to grind ECDSA signatures to to produce um, uh, a shorter, um, I guess it's the, it must be the res the response. It's not the R point. Yeah, it's, it's a low R grind. Oh, okay, so it is a low R grind. Okay, so um, if you spend some CPU time, um, you can produce slightly shorter ECDSA signatures and save a byte and reduce your fees, but that's a statistically distinguishable pattern. Uh, the value you use for end lock time, even if you don't intend to do lock time, like anti fee sniping, the fees you pay, so the actual values, uh, the fee rate value that you can calculate, how the, the wallet, you can draw inferences about how the wallet does uh, rounding, uh, where it obtained um, estimation information from. Um, so yeah, lo lots of uh, additional interesting information that we're not going to really go into today. And um, yeah, um, so here's a slightly more sophisticated Transaction and and um, I guess I want to pose a question. Like anybody want to hazard a guess as to what's going on here? This transaction is kind of like deliberately a bit weird because um, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to make a point about the two main heuristics that um, are employed. So. The two main heuristics, they go back to the Satoshi white paper and they've been expanded on uh, considerably. Um, the first is the common input ownership heuristic. And what this heuristic says is 
Uh, generally, you can assume that all of the inputs to a single transaction belong to a single entity. Um, and the other main heuristic that's been used um, is uh, change identification. Um, so, yeah, um, change identification is a bit more nebulous and vague, but um, you, you, th th there's various ways in which you might guess um, better than chance as to, to whether or not an output is sending back to the same, uh, to, to the originator, uh, for example, the script type, the, the, um, the, the value itself, if it's got excess precision, and, and so on. Um, so, in light of these two heuristics, uh, anybody want to hazard a guess as to like why this is such a weird structure? Just to like, just to like make sure we're looking at the left column, the numbers of the inputs. Yes. The right one are the outputs, and then so what we have here is a picture of one transaction being spent has three outputs. Two of those are getting spent in the second transaction to the right, and that has two outputs. Yes, correct. And then what was the question again? Sorry. Like, why make such a weird transaction? Why like, makes what makes the transaction weird? Well, uh, so I think Lisa just pointed out. Okay. Why, uh, like, what makes it weird? Um, maybe I was taking too much for granted, but like, why would you create two values that are, like, if the second transaction really is done by a single entity, um, why would it have created those two outputs in the first place? Um, so, yeah. Consolidation? The, Consolidation? I don't know. I think that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Consolidation, maybe not for this particular um, example, I think would make sense sometimes. Um, but what I was kind of getting at here is. Um, Page jumps, uh, if you're familiar. So, um, what is the the most straightforward way of like breaking these heuristics? Um, if uh, and, and this relates to whether or not um, values are this is what's called the unnecessary input heuristic one and two um, in, in these discussions. Uh, I think that's on the BIP seventy eight um, pull request. Um, so. Like, even when we break these heuristics, like, sometimes you can still conclude quite a bit from the structure. So, like, I would say that the, the most rational interpretation of this kind of weird thing is that there's two users here, both on the left side and on the right side, both of the, so the earlier transaction and the second transaction, um, and they're transferring values between them, and they're basically just uh, settling up, and um, so that the actual payment amount is uh, hidden in this case, but uh, could be inferred. So like in the, in the second transaction, maybe user 2 is sending 0.4 Bitcoin to user 1. And in the first transaction, uh, like they're doing some consolidations or something, and um, I think I set it up such that there's still like a net transfer of value between them. Yeah, I think user 1 has to send 0.1 to user 2. Um, and yeah, this is maybe um, a, a slightly stronger example of that, where um, um, actually I think in the interest of time, I, I want to slightly skip ahead um, and look at a, a much more plausible page join that is actually um, covert in the sense that it's it could be interpreted as just a payment. Could it? No, I screwed up. Sorry, I had not intended to put 1.1 in there. Assume that that value was slightly uh, smaller, and then um, the unnecessary input heuristic would have been um, uh, would not have been violated. Um, and this transaction would have two valid interpretations: um, one as uh, a single payment by a single user that owns two coins, um, versus a, uh, a two-party transaction uh, where uh, one party sent uh, 0 0.1 to the other. Um, well, what I've noticed is, is how difficult it is to avoid UIH1 and 2 actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, case in point, right? <laughs> when I did it in JoinMark, I, you know, I actually threw up my hands because the first version I wrote, I was like writing three complex algorithms. The second one I thought, like, if it fits 78, I thought, just screw it, I'm just going to use one coin each time. Because the thing is, even if you, if you uh, in quotes, 
entirely by agreeing with the OIH. Actually, like, like 20 or 30 percent of transactions on the network are violated anyway. So, you see what I mean? So, it doesn't necessarily matter Ooh. for some of you. Yeah, well, this is what the RMT actually wrote in the original gist when we discussed it. He's like, yeah, well, Chris Belcher came up with the concept of UIH, and he's like, uh, but Laura actually did statistical analysis on blockchain, and said, actually, you know, like 20 to 30 percent of transactions do this anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. But you have to look at the, he's, the, the, the table's still there. I'll need to refresh my memory now. I'm not yeah, really going to find out because. Is, is there any, brand, <laughs> any theory as to. Ah, no, I think. Okay, like, ah, let's take it offline. No, no, it's. Uh, um, okay, so one of the. Like, the. the, the notice that uh, this paper, and I, I should have been more careful about the formatting. Um, so this is by uh, Dorit Ron and Adi Shamir. Um, I think that preprint dates back to like 2011, but it was uh, published in 2013. So as far as I know, it's, it's the first paper that tries to analyze um, the transaction structure and um, kind of applies Satoshi's heuristics to the actual blockchain. Um, and already at the time, they were able to make um, uh, fairly strong inferences based on correlation to like. Public, uh, publicly known addresses. Um, the next paper that I think is quite interesting is by uh, Sarah Michael John, and I forget the names of her co-authors. There's like five of them here, and I, I, so um, what makes that paper interesting compared to the others is that they actually got a budget and they sent money through Bitcoin mixers, and they try to see where it goes and. Um, uh, Again, make inferences using the same techniques uh, as the, the previous work, um, but with um, uh, test particles, basically. And despite these results and some results that came later, it was still largely not settled. You know, how, how effective are these heuristics? Like, how good is clustering really? Um, and a famous example of that is the Wallet Explorer site, which uh, attempted to attribute um, to various entities, different addresses, and due to a quirk of uh, another scanning exchange, uh, Mt. Gox, uh, allowing you to submit your own private keys uh, directly. Um, accidentally, Wallet Explorer has created like a huge cluster where everybody who had ever done this and had ever transacted with Mt. Gox is not part of a single, like, that's one user. And I think it's called Mt. Gox and others. Yeah, Mt. Gox, by the way, the early join we were all in our So, yeah, fun times. Um, but where I, I think the real groundbreaking work here is um, um, the reason I crossed out that 37 earlier, why it's not considered private. So this was um, Jonas Nick's um, master thesis. He demonstrated, like, the, the Bit 37 filters, um, essentially you give a compact description of the kinds of addresses that you're interested in with some false positive rate to your peers. And you tell them, like, please only tell me about stuff that pertains to this filter. Um, and the theory was if you add noise to these filters, then the, the peer should not be able to conclude which addresses you're really interested in. Unfortunately, because this was not... Um, um, done very, like, as a model it doesn't really make sense, and, um, like, it's always going to leak, but the way it was implemented, if I understood, if I understand correctly, was even worse than it theoretically could have been. But you can just take the logical end of various plume filters collected over time, and eventually distill it back to um, a very narrow filter that only matches uh, the addresses belonging to a specific client, and this was done for light clients as well, so that they um, don't really have the capability to like be very strategic about this, right? They're trying to reduce the bandwidth, um, they probably don't have uh, um, reliable long-term storage, uh, or you know, various other assumptions that you can make that um, led developers to basically just re-randomize the filters each time. So Jones collected these filters over a period of uh, several months, if I remember correctly, and um, then because of this, he was able to obtain uh, very high quality clustering for uh, actual wallets. And there's a selection effect here. It's you know light clients as of around 2015, but um, this allowed him to 
basically estimate for that class of clients how powerful are these heuristics, and he came up with a figure of like greater than 80% recall. So um, if you only use the heuristics and you try to guess whether such a client, um, like such an address belongs to a client based on these clustering heuristics, 80% plus of the time you're, you would have been correct at the time. Um, yeah. yeah, I think the this is something that kind of like troubles me. Like Golem coded sets and Bloom filters, the only distinction that matters there is uh, it's not inherent to Bloom filters and it's not inherent to Golem coded sets to fix it. That's just an efficiency thing. Like one is better than the other um, at higher um, like Bloom filters have a constant size and so. so that's a, an irrelevant engineering detail, but the, the, the thing that's relevant is whether or not you download filters that describe the blockchain, query them locally, and then decide what to further download, uh, hopefully from a different client, or whether or not you send to your peers a description of only the data that you're interested in. I think that's the, the, the qualitative distinction that really you know, is, is important to, to highlight. Is there anything that still uses I don't know, to be honest. I know that it's, but it's been deprecated for a while. I think it's still supported in core, but you have to enable it manually. Um, there's definitely still nodes that's supported on the network, last I checked, but that was like more than two years ago. So. What was the question? Uh, are, are there still wallets which use GUT37 um, blue filters? Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so, those heuristics um, lead us to these like three qualitative, I think, notions of privacy enhanced transactions uh, in Bitcoin. Um, overt transactions, uh, so for example, uh, coin join transactions uh, are easy to identify, right? They look like coin joins. Um, and yet they provide a certain notion of, of uh, ambiguity and anonymity within them. So are they private or not? Um, like, I think it kind of depends whether or not your threat model is more about hiding in the crowd, whether, like, or, or signaling to the world that you're interested in privacy. And, and you, you could come up with different answers depending. Um, and Adam, you, your talk is tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, please go to uh, Adam's talk on CoinJoin XT, which is going to look at the relationship between uh, Lightning and CoinJoin and. Uh, uh, um, well, uh, so, oops, what have I done? So, um, I need to learn how to do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, CoinJoin XT is, is like a cool concept where, um, like, perhaps we can do coin joins that actually don't look at all like coin joins. Um, and arguably, the most powerful, like, on chain footprint is uh, disjoint privacy. So, like, the, the transactions are not even uh, linked to each other. So. Uh, CoinSwap uh, fits that description, um, state chain, uh, so Mercury state chains um, is a kind of coin swap. and Chris Belcher's, uh, I think it's not yet released, right? So uh, Teleport Transactions is another um, project to look out for. Uh, and this is kind of an obscure paper from 2015, which is cool, uh, called Coin Party. It never really gained adoption because it makes um, some unreasonable assumptions about uh, theft resistance. Like you basically reduce the entire protocol to a multi-party computation where if the majority of the servers are honest, you're guaranteed, um, uh, it, it's like a hybridization of coin join and coin swap. It has the on-chain footprint of a coin swap, but the scalability of a, a coin join. But the trade-off there is that you don't, you're not actually guaranteed that nobody can steal your funds like you are in coin joints. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting paper, but yeah, no surprise that it hasn't uh, really made a, like been, been implemented. Um, yeah. So, so what does a, a typical like uh, overly simplified uh, coin join look like? Um, in this transaction, we can see. Uh, ho hopefully, it looks kind of obvious to everybody. Uh, one user is coming in with 1.1, and uh, the other user is coming in with these uh, two coins, and, um, and then they construct this transaction, and only looking at the, the blockchain, you can't really know which 
of those 1.0 coins belongs to whom. Um, on the other hand, the change outputs, um, because they are relatable to the, the inputs, like we can conclude with high certainty that this output belongs to the first user, the owner of this coin, and this change output belongs to the second user, the, the owner of the, the two coins. Um, that said, um, we, we can say that the, the mixed outputs here are k anonymous where k is equal to 2. Um, does this intuition make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, oh, wait, and I got ahead of myself. Put the colors in there. Uh, okay. So, um, the next kind of concept that's very interesting for coin joints, like if you have a larger transaction, and here we're going to be ignoring the fees um, just for, for a few slides because otherwise it gets too messy. Um, is there a, a difference between um, like this slide and the previous slide? Uh, anybody care to? Can you play the test for a second? Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm struggling. Again, like the fees are zero in this example, but um, th there's a slide later where they come back. So the question is, if one transaction with four inputs of the same size and four outputs of the same size is equivalent to two transactions that are being spent with two outputs each, except one of them is accepted the cross. Yeah, exactly. So, so my claim, and it's not my claim, it's uh, Greg Maxwell's claim from the original Bitcoin talk post, is that um, the, the transaction size limit is not really an issue. Right? You could have these structures, which uh, he referred to clause networks, which is a specific kind of um, structure. Um, more generally, they're known as interconnection networks. Um, so these are uh, graphs that were studied for um, like uh, telecommunication stuff. Um, and interconnection networks represent the optimal, um, and optimal could mean number of nodes or number of edges, but the, the idea is that like, every input could have ended at every other output with, with equal probability, and you can think of it as like um, a, a switching board that's trying to connect a certain side to, to, to another. That's why they were studied in the context of telecommunications. Um, I, I would say, actually, that claim is maybe um, like you could strengthen it, right? Like it doesn't need to be that regularized. Um, uh, and if we had a randomized graph that still has a good enough degree of connectivity and still has um, good uniformity within the structure, we could find instances of, of such interconnection networks embedded within a, a, a less um, structured a transaction graph that still has the same properties. Sorry, can you just, mm -hmm. just clarify exactly what property we're claiming in this house? That every one of the four outputs here could have come from any one of the four original yes. outputs from the, on the left side? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so like this four user, four input, four output transaction from a privacy standpoint is exactly equivalent to this uh, less efficient structure, right? This is strictly more, come on, strictly more block space, but from a privacy standpoint, there's no difference between them. Um, okay, so unfortunately, like, we live in the real world and we need to pay fees, so um, the, unless you form it in this highly irregular way, right, if there's a different depth um, for the, the inputs and outputs, um, right, like, imagine there was one more intermediate step here, we could no longer produce these uniform outputs at the end because we'd run out of, um, uh, like, sats. Uh, so, um, when, whenever we think of this stuff, we need to, to be very careful about, like, what is actually possible to do um, with a single coin um, going into the, the, the mix. Um, and for this reason, you, you typically need to, um, either change the denomination over time, which is problematic in its own right, but nullifies the, 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 the argument of the previous slides, um, or you need to um, uh, do consolidations, which um, uh, 
implying that there is a, a linkability on the input side. What about uh, like what Samurai does with the TX0 where you like kind of prepay and then the new entrants pay the transaction fees? So I'm going to get to that I think on the slide after next. Um, I think it's a bullshit meme, honestly. Like TX0 has no, like, if you were to put the same exact structure just concatenate it into the first mix, what's the difference, right? Like, yeah, I agree. Um, and the change up is still associated with it. Uh, there's still consolidation on the input side. Um, so it's like, yeah, DX0 I think is more of an engineering consideration. I think it has, it, there's no, no meaning whatsoever for, for privacy. But, uh, by the way, there's a nice research paper from 2014 about these switch network like um, coin joins uh, by Oliver Kotu. I'm not sure if you know about it, but it came to my attention recently. It's really interesting. It's quite, quite early explaining the concept you're talking about now. I'm not familiar with that one. Oliver Couture? Couture. C-O-U-T-U. C-O-U-T-U. University of uh, Montreal, uh, 2014. So, University of Montreal, 2014. I'm, I'm not familiar with this paper, but... Um, um, okay, so... Uh, let's briefly discuss change. Even though I thought I wrote too few slides, I see that I'm running out of time. Um, so, um, what's happening here? Uh, a single user has made two coin joins and obtained two private coins, and then is making two independent payments, which ideally should not be linkable to each other, right? Like maybe uh, the first transaction is paying for some contraband, and the second transaction is paying for rent, and those two things uh, need to be. Uh, to remain segregated. The problem is, if our denomination is 1.0, uh, we're kind of stuck here, right? Like, what does what, what can the user do? And, and if the payment amounts are expected to distribute uniformly, in expectation, this user has a trade-off. Either they lose, on average, half of their money, half of their money becomes useless because they can't spend it privately anymore, or they need to compromise on privacy. Uh, and this is what's known as the Toxic change problem. So, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. I don't yeah. understand. Why is there a problem as to uh, the same transaction? So right now there is no problem yet. This is just uh, setting it up. And here in, in the in the next slide, like this is where the problem happens after the fact. Where um, so these are the same two transactions which should be indistinguishable, but now the the user's wallet has taken the two two change outputs and used them on the input side of of a coin join produced a coin that's got k anonymity of 2 on this side, but in doing so, the wallet has undermined the, the privacy guarantees of the previous mixes. Um, so this is perhaps the, um, the problem of, of coin joins, right? The, the, um, the, the, the uniformity of coin joins um, kind of forces us into this. And even when you have multiple denominations in various mixing pools, as Whirlpool does, at some point you reach the bottom, right? Like, you, you still, in expectation, lose half of the smallest um, uh, pool denomination uh, per terminal payment. Um, uh, again, if you assume that um, payment amounts distribute uniformly. Um, I don't know if that's a reasonable assumption, but... Um, so this is, uh, yeah, super important if anybody has questions uh, about the toxic change. Okay. Um, so how do we try, yeah? Oh, sorry. Um, like applying the, um, like if we relax this uniformity assumption um, and we try and, and analyze not as uh, k-anonymity, um, we try and analyze uh, using the entropic perspective what's going on. Uh, the first work that I think um, did this, there were some discussions on the original CoinJoin uh, thread on Bitcoin Talk, but I think uh, Laurent is the first to actually do the work. Um, and basically imagine that you go through every combination of inputs and outputs, sum them up together, subtract the outputs from the inputs, and then see is the remainder like a reasonable fee amount. If it is, then this could have been like the subset of inputs and outputs that belongs to a single user. Um, and I think two years later, there was a, a paper called Anonymous Coin Joint Transactions with Arbitrary Values, which 
uh, does not sign uh, as cite uh, Laurent's uh, work, but um, uh, does propose the same model, um, slightly more refined. Um, uh, they call this the subtransaction model, and they, they make a distinction between um, derived and non-derived subtransactions. So, like, uh, arguably, if you take their model seriously, then uh, Laurent has uh, slightly overestimated um, the entropy. Um, and, yeah, this is a very interesting paper, um, precisely because of, of this model. It, it actually tries to propose um, an approach for um, coin joints that support payments of arbitrary amounts, but um, I, I don't find that very compelling for various reasons. But one thing I would hazard is um, there is a very common misconception um, that because these two algorithms um, are, they take exponential time, uh, time exponential and the size of the transaction to, to calculate. This implies that there's some sort of like computational hardness uh, based um, privacy assurance. That is actually not the case at all because many, many special cases of these kinds of constraint problems uh, can this be solved. Um, so in Scaling Bitcoin 2019, I demonstrated in a very hacky way and subsequently lost the code uh, to do a disk rash, but uh, right, even though I was, uh, I produced something very far from production worthy in about two weeks of work, um, and I managed to crash like every dependency I, I tried to use, I'm absolutely certain that the, the professionals working at chain analytics companies are able to use commercial solvers for these uh, constraint problems, they have much more uh, resources, so, um, where does this apply? Uh, TX0, um, uh, that's kind of trivial, right? The, the, the change output and the input cluster is associated early in the space of a single transaction. However, that's kind of the same as what Wasabi 1.0 coin joints did, where uh, everybody's inputs and change outputs were all smushed together. Um, and there was, there, there's this misconception that this is somewhat harder to break, right? The, the, the mixed output side is, is not really possible to break, but the, the uh, input clustering seemed computationally hard. It turns out that um, like solvers can do this on the order of seconds and spit out a, uh, if, if you have the right constraint model, they can spit out um, the input clusters and the corresponding change output with um, very high uh, like, it, it's very rare that there's ambiguity after solving for the, the constraint model. Um, and this becomes even more brittle when you consider that, like, the adversary can make progress, right? Like, every user that you manage to de-anonymize, if you had an exponential increase in difficulty, by symmetry you have an exponential decrease in, in the difficulty with every marginal user that you attack successfully. Wait, so can I, can I like, kind of restate that maybe? Just yep. Like a, so what I think you're saying is that by naively, these are computationally difficult problems to solve. Yes. But given some context, um, they become much quicker, like context being like maybe some other information about the inputs, etc. they become much, much faster to solve than you would assume by naive computational like calculations. So that's, that statement is true, but not what I meant. I was making an even stronger claim, which is even without external information, all you need is a, a constraint system um, and a solver that is able to prune the search space efficiently and a, a very large number. So fully, generally, this is still NP complete. Um, but many practical instances with real world values are actually uh, solvable in linear time. Maybe to give people an example of why, why it might be in practice. Just, for example, you've got 50 inputs, but one of them is like 100 Bitcoin, and all the other ones are like 0 0.2. Just that in itself could give you a starting point where you're guessing that that can be combined with certain outputs. And you'll find that quickly. Once you've found that, then maybe you, could, you start proving the search space lower and lower. And yep. The whole thing collapses. You know? Theory is exponential, but practice most of the time is. Yeah, the, the way the, the mixed integer programming approach is, like, works, it's. it's um, you, you can imagine sort of like hyperspace of different possibilities, and you you kind of slice it using hyperplanes, and you every such slice removes uh, potentially up to one half of the search space and completely excludes various combinations that are just like 
or variable assignments in these models. Um, and, and even though there are cases where the solver is not able to do this efficiently, for many practical instances, they are able to, to output in a, a very short time, like some solution. Um, and you can enumerate this too. Like if the solution is ambiguous, you can further you can take the model and add the constraint that it's like give me a new solution which is not the previous solution. And many solvers are able to do this much more efficiently uh, by reusing the the results of the previous computation. So it's not just coming up with a solution; it's exhaustively enumerating all solutions is is uh, theoretically possible. Um, okay, so how does this kind of thing look like? Um, Here's the, the most trivial example, uh, shared coin um, style coin join where you just smoosh together like the actions of different users. So um, in this example, like what I'm trying to imply is that one user, um, I think, yeah, I screwed up the amounts again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I think I meant to do like zero point, yeah. Uh, so the, the implication here is supposed to be that the 1.0 made a payment or creating an output of 0 0.7 has a change of 0 0.2999 and the, uh, uh, no, it still doesn't add up. I think I, oh, I know what I did. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I numbered some of the inputs. Uh, yes, this is what I did. I, I didn't give it a distinct ID. Um, is it? I'm not going to fix it now. This is not the time. Oh, what have I done? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the point is, like, if you stare at this long enough and the values are actually correct, then you're supposed to infer that there's no possible way that the 0 0.7 output could have been created without, by, by a different user than the one who controlled the specific input and another. Right? You, you can basically slice this into um, sub-transactions as happened. So I, I noticed that in the, there's like normally two minutes left. Um, I guess um, there's an example here of, of knapsack mixing, um, which tries to improve on the, the previous um, by doing clever splitting of outputs. I'm not going to go into it. Um, the paper is quite clear. Um, I don't think it's a very practical model because it tacitly assumes that you're only making payments and the, the ambiguity guarantees, like what it's trying to do is by construction ensure that instead of the, the model being hard to solve, that the, it generates many valid solutions. Um, and um, there is a, an even easier way of generating uh, many solutions, which is um, by favoring lowing, lower having weight values. Uh, so having weight refers to the number of non-zero symbols you need to represent a message in some language. So when you're encoding numbers, uh, like in binary, it's how many one bits you have in there. Um, this is maybe not strictly correct, but like if we take the one to five series, like so how many coins, right? Like um, so what I was trying to do here is um, um, you're supposed to see that you can kind of build 1.23 out of combinations of another output and you can decompose it in here and so like if you construct a transaction that's kind of like this even though it has arbitrary values on both the input side and the output side it is then constructed in such a way that there's always ambiguity right like for for every um, narrative that claims that um, you know user 1.23 output 1.0 and 0 0.2 and these four coins that's they're ordered by the way for uh, ease of uh, reading but like in reality they should be shuffled um, uh, in principle that user could claim like no look see there's another user that has one and another user that has 0.2 and another user that has uh, 0 0.02 and I guess I forgot this oh screwed up on the input numbering again, but there's supposed to be like a 0 0.01 as well. Uh, I'll, I'll fix these diagrams before I upload them, so... Um, but, um, yeah, you, you, you can uh, basically set it up so that this stuff is um, uh, much more robust than the Knapsack uh, paper proposes. 
Um, and um, it has nice properties as well, where you, you can think of each of these like larger conjoins as being built out of the concatenation of uh, uniform conjoins and arbitrary amounts, and the uniform part of the graph could itself be an interconnection network. So, um, like you have multiple large conjoins, and within, say, conjoin A, there's going to be two values uh, that are like um, the same value, and then each of those goes into another conjoin with the same um, value. Um, like the, the privacy argument of uh, before kind of still holds. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm out of time. Um, just to summarize uh, the rest of this stuff, um, I think the correct perspective to look at all this stuff is try and, assuming a threat model, quantify the risk and the harm to users by losing privacy. Um, you know, th these are models, right? Um, but once you've once a user has accepted that model, in some sense we can approximate their utility or the loss of utility that they experience from losing privacy. And you can bound that, right? Like if they agreed to use the wallet and the, the fee cost of the wallet is something known, then you can assume that the, the harm to the user from not using it is at least as high as what they're willing to pay. Um, and um, this gives rise to like an optimization perspective the decision space here is which coins do you select, which puppets do you uh, choose to, to register, uh, and when and with whom do you coin join, and what fee rates and so on. Um, and uh, even if the code does not explicitly describe such a function, um, mathematically you can still model what the wallet is doing in the abstract. So a cost function always exists, um, and I would claim that it is the, like, our responsibility as a community to contend with, with um, such cost functions, attempt to minimize them, attempt to improve the accuracy which with, with which they model the user's utility. Um, and even if it's a, you know, a very basic thing, um, like that's still significantly more rigorous and evolvable than um, like the, the current state of the art. Um, um, and there's a lot of... Um, like, I have some simulation results that give me very good reasons to believe that if we do this well enough, then the marginal cost of privacy um, could be, could, could approach, um, you know, the, the, a, a naive privacy nihilist sort of strategy. Uh, maybe not beat it without crossing, but signature aggregation, actually reaching that requires uh, some notion of batching and um, low time preference, at least for some users, but uh, we can do much better than the, the current like mixed approach to, to coin joins. Um, yeah, uh, please uh, approach me offline. I want to tell you about like various open problems, the challenges of the practical prob uh, protocols with regards to uh, denial of service, um, various uh, privacy leaks, stuff like that. Um, and I'm also happy to tell you what I've been uh, researching and working on uh, over the last few months um, with regards to that. And, uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah, Adam? Um, I'm maybe, I don't know if this question's reasonable, but is there any like way to assess, because a lot of the talk ended up being about anonymity sets, right? Defining K anonymity. Can we, is there any like model we can apply to a more stenographic? You know, you call it cohorts. So let's say coin XT, because you, you know what that means. So, so can we talk about and can we quantify that properly in that model? If we succeed in making it properly stenographic. Yes, so the coin party paper does a very interesting analysis. Oh. Um, I think there's another paper by Malta Moser that tries to estimate how many coin swaps could have been occurring. Oh. So kind of the perspective there is just uh, like instead of looking at the transaction graph to try and enumerate a set of potential coins, and there, by the way, there's a very big open question, which is how do we generalize? Like even this more sophisticated entropic model assumes a single point of origin, right? Like for for the blockchain, where we have uh, multiple inputs that could be consolidated, you have like a whole history that could be implicated in, in a single coin. It's not clear. Like I think you need to do like fancy stuff with. Um, um, what is it called? Um, like disjoint probability distributions? 
or I, I don't know. I don't even know the terminology here. But like, so so yeah, it's 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 both. How do you define the set? And that would be like um, the the approach that they took in Coin Party um, and in that uh, Maltimoza paper was um, looking at the time windows. So if you see transactions that appear time locked, you look at all the um, coincident transactions that are of roughly the same amount. And you need to account for those in your anonymity set. Um, but then, so for coin swap, maybe it's simpler because it's like swapping discrete values, but not Belcher's uh, like routing coin swaps. That reintroduces the, the issue of um, uh, having fragmentation and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I really don't have a good uh, answer for how you would estimate the entropy of those anonymity sets. But um, and, and I do strongly believe that. Uh, when when you are dealing with larger anonymity sets, you certainly need that, that more refined approach because the, the assumption that the probability is uniform across the set becomes very unreasonable. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you.